All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to the first training workshop of the California Bumblebee Atlas. We're really glad you're here. Uh, we're going to be uh, together for about two hours, and you will hear from the three of us. I'm Lee Richardson, a conservation biologist with the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. We will also hear from Rich Hatfield, a senior conservation biologist with Xerces, and from Dylan Wink Winkler, who works for California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and we all work on this project together. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Rich, who is going to present for the first 20 minutes. Um, then you'll hear from the other two of us. We're going to take a short intermission about halfway through here, just five minutes uh, for any, any needs, and, um, but we'll be pretty busy for the next two hours. So um, thank you for being here. Welcome. Great. Uh, Leif, can you see my screen or Dylan, just give me a thumbs up that you can see my Looks screen. Good. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, just a few ground rules here as we get started. Most of you are probably familiar with Zoom at this point. Um, I don't, I'm not sure whether you can see a chat feature at the bottom, but if, if, if you can, we're, we're gonna try to keep our questions to the Q&A. There should be an opportunity for you to drop questions in there. And, and those of us that are not presenting at any given module will be monitoring that Q&A neither answering questions or flagging them for, for time after each module is presented. Um, I would also just ask that if you see the opportunity to raise your hand that you refrain from doing so. <laughs> it just can be distracting when, when you're presenting as it sort of does these flashes. And I, I at least personally find it distracting. So if you could avoid raising your hand, I would appreciate it. Um, and I think with that, I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so we're gonna talk to you today, obviously, about the California Bumblebee Atlas. Um, today's a really just a, a focused training where we're gonna focus on the nuts and bolts of the project, give you a bit of contextual information so that you can understand why we're doing it. But the purpose of us meeting today is just really to teach you how to do the work that we're asking you to do um, and to hopefully, hopefully get you excited about doing it. <clears throat> Um, so let's just go ahead and get started. As, as Leif mentioned, um, both he and I work for the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. We're a nonprofit. We're based in Portland, Oregon, which is actually where I work um, and direct our bumblebee conservation program. And um, we also have a native pollinator program, um, an endangered species program, an aquatic invertebrate program, a butterfly conservation program, and a pesticide program that sort of serves as the umbrella for all of these other um, programs and, and obviously has, has links that tie them all together. Um, we approach our work in a number of different ways. We do education, conservation, research, advocacy um, to help protect invertebrates and their habitat. And this means a number of different things. Sometimes it means we're out in the field actively collecting data um, and providing input to land management agencies about what we find. Um, or conducting advocacy based on what we find. Other times it means we're interacting with folks like you and asking them to help us collect these data. So we have a bunch of community science programs. We have bumblebee atlases in 15 states now, including California. Um, we have Bumblebee Watch, which is in the other um, 35 states in, in the United States, as well as throughout Canada. Um, we have our Western Monarch Thanksgiving counts and New Year's counts. Um, we have a Western Monarch um, milkweed mapper. We do freshwater mussel surveys with, with community scientists, and we're just launching our Firefly Atlas this, this coming year, and um, we'll be doing more community science as it has become a valuable part of our um, programs. As I mentioned, we also do policy and advocacy around invertebrates and their habitat and pesticides. Um, so when, when appropriate, we'll advocate for appropriate federal, state, and local policies that will benefit invertebrates and their habitats. And then we also do just a lot of outreach uh, and education. Um, since 2008, we've, we've conducted outreach to over 100,000 professional biologists um, throughout much of North America, as well as um, some in Europe and Asia. So we're really a, a worldwide organization. Um, and then we also do on the ground conservation. Um, a lot of this work happens on farms where we're actually working with farmers, teaching them how to manage their land in ways that will increase invertebrate biodiversity. Um, 
And to date, we've restored uh, over 900,000 acres throughout North America. And we've helped protect and restore over 1.5 million acres for rare and at risk um, invertebrates on public lands throughout the United States. We are a member supported organization. For those of you that are members, thank you so much for being here today and for your support. We really appreciate it. For those of you that are not members, we really encourage you, if you appreciate what you hear today and the work that we're doing, becoming a, a member and a part of the team. And the URL here on the screen, xerces.org slash donate, is the way to do that. And we would be delighted to have you. Um, those logistics aside, um, let's dive right into the content. As Leif mentioned, we've got three modules for you here tonight. Um, the first one is going to be a brief introduction to um, bumblebee uh, ecology and a, and a little bit about conservation. Um, and then we'll dive into the nuts and bolts of, of the atlas and how to participate. And then we'll end talking about a few of California bumblebees sort of key species to identify and, the, and their lookalikes. We'll try to have a, a brief five minute break in there for folks to, to walk around, stretch their legs, maybe go to the bathroom. Um, but depending on where we are with time and how many questions you all have as we go through this material, we may sort of have to skip out on that break. We'll just see how it's going, but we'll, we'll try to, to start and end on time here so that we can be respectful of everybody's time. Okay, um, so, you know, at a real baseline, whenever I say I'm sitting next to somebody <laughs> on a plane or uh, at a party and meet someone for the first time and I tell them I work for the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. Um, once we get over the fact that they think I'm an exorcist <laughs> um, and we get on to the word invertebrate uh, and, and then they remember what an invertebrate is, I often sort of have to explain why I spend my career dedicated to conserving these important animals. A lot of people think of invertebrates as the, the sort of slimy, stingy things in their lives that they're trying to get rid of. And, I do understand that I'm that I'm probably talking to a, a group of relatively informed folks here, and that you all can understand and appreciate that invertebrates are incredibly important for biodiversity. But but the vast majority of people on this planet really don't understand that. And um, you know, as uh, as was said in in the New York Times here, the fate of the world's insects is inseparable from our own. And and the reason for that is. They're just, in addition to the incredible biodiversity on the planet, over 90% of animal biodiversity are invertebrates. They're also so important for ecosystem function. So they're conducting bio decomposition. So they're breaking down uh, our, our minerals and returning them to the soil so that we can continue to, to grow plants um, and, and other things. They're conducting biocontrol in, in our wildlands, as well as in our farm fields, reducing the need for chemical inputs. Um, and they're also the base of the food chain. So, you know, everything from fish and small mammals all the way up to grizzly bears are, are, have a significant portion of their diet that's actually made up directly um, of invertebrates. And in addition to directly feeding many of us, or, or many of the animals on the planet, they also indirectly feed us through this um, process called pollination, which is essentially plant sex, um, and, and the products that then come from those plants, including fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, um, and, those, and those sorts of things. Um, and, and because of that role, uh, we think of pollinators as what we call keystone species. And keystone species are sort of animals or that, that are contributing to the world more than you might expect from their size or appearance alone. So if you were just outside and had no understanding of, of pollination and you saw a bee fly by, you might say, oh, that's cute, or look at that beautiful animal, but you probably wouldn't have this huge grasp of the impact they're having both through our economy and our ecology. Um, so more than 85% of the flowering plants um, on the planet require an animal for, for pollination services. And, and usually that animal is an insect particularly here in North America. Um, in addition to that, uh, a vast majority of, uh, or not a vast majority, but a lot of the, the crop um, production out there is also dependent on insect pollination. Um, so 10% of the economic value of global agriculture is due to pollinators. And this adds up to billions of dollars um, at the global scale. <clears throat> 
And, and it's, it's important to recognize that wild bees, in addition to honeybees, provide the majority um, of pollination to agriculture. And this is true whether managed honeybees are present or not. So, so the, the presence of wild bees in an agricultural system actually increases the efficiency of pollination even when honeybees are present because um, they, they change the way that the animals behave and that behavioral um, adaptation to that situation actually increases fruit set in a lot of those plants. So native bees are really, really important for both wildland and agricultural pollination. There are really six main groups of, of insect pollinators. In the upper left here, we have beetles. In the upper middle, we have butterflies. And we could also include moths here, um, although there's not a picture um, on this slide. Um, and then in the lower left, we have flies. Um, in the lower middle, you have uh, wasps. And then here on the right, there, there are bees. And of these sort of six main groups of insect pollinators, bees are, are really the best of, of them. And the reason for that is um, that they, they eat pollen and nectar as their really only source of food. <clears throat> so they're flying around the landscape and actually intentionally collecting pollen and putting it on their body, like you see on, on this bumblebee here. It's covered itself in pollen, and its goal is to bring that pollen back to its nest because it's actually going to lay its eggs directly on that nest, and that's going to be its larval, uh, its larvae or its offspring's sole source of protein. So they're actually intentionally putting it on their bodies and intentionally moving it through the landscape. The purpose is not for pollination. But the, the outcome of that is that they, you know, as they fly around, they, they just happen to spill pollen grains as they fly from flower to flower. And that is the active process of fertilization, which leads to fruit set. And um, since bumblebees and, and other bees are actually intentionally moving pollen through the landscape, they're just excellent pollinators. All of those other animals that I mentioned, when they visit a flower, they tend to be there only to drink nectar. So they're there just for the sugar source, which bees also drink so that they can have the energy to move from flower to flower and find a mate and all of those other things that we need energy for. But those other animals are not intentionally collecting pollen. They might happen to have some pollen fall on them as they're drinking nectar or, or end up with a few grains on their body. But you'd be hard pressed to find pictures of, of any of those other groups of animals that are covered in pollen like the bee that you see here. And that behavioral adaptation of collecting and moving pollen makes bees really the, the best pollinators on the planet. And there are um, six or seven, there's six families of, of bees in North America. Um, and, and they're sort of pictured here. And, and it gives you some sense of the sort of diversity of, of bees that are on the planet. You can see if you look, um, there's a little uh, arrow down here, which sort of shows where bees speciated. So at, at this point, you can sort of think of this as, as a phylogeny where we're following animals along a common ancestor. And we can follow all these lines or, or all these families or subfamilies or superfamilies of bees back down to this common ancestor. And I think one thing that's really interesting to see here is that this is the point in time on planet Earth where we were getting an explosion of angi angiosperms or flowering plants. So, so bees and flowering plants were co-evolving together and leading to this speciation. So feedback between different bee bees visiting different plants was leading to new plants. And in turn, different plants advertising different ways to collect and gather pollen was leading to different species of bees. And we got this explosion of speciation in these two really related groups of animals. Just because we're going to be talking about bumblebees today, I just want to give you some sense for sort of how rare bumblebees are on the landscape in terms of their behavioral adaptation of having queens and um, a division of labor. If you see here on this chart, on the left here, it says the majority of, of species here are solitary, and 65% of them are ground nesting, and around 35% of them are what we call above, above ground cavity nesting. These are our, our mason bees that live in, in tunnels and tubes above the ground. Um, and, and it's really this idea of being social or living together with other bees is pretty rare in the bee world. You can see the red boxes that just appeared 
show the, the families or super families of bees that have some sociality. So you can see most of these animals are solitary, living completely by themselves. And then eusocial is, is this idea of really having a division of labor where there's a queen and there's workers and there's males all sort of living together in the same place. And then you can see that, that that's even more rare. There's really only a couple um, super families of bees that have that, some in the, in the, in the family um, Helictidae and some in the, um, in the family Apidae here. And the Apinae here is this group of animals which include the bumblebees and, and honeybees. Um, and I think it's important to recognize also that, that this idea of honey making is, is exceedingly rare. There are really only about five species of honeybees in the world. And there's a maybe 150 or so um, stingless bees in the neotropics that also make measurable amounts of honey. But, but making honey is a really rare thing in the bee world. And I just think that's important context for folks to have. So there's incredible wild bee diversity um, on, on the planet. We've got 20,000 species uh, or so in the world. Um, in North America, including Mexico, there are around 5,200 species of bees. In the United States and Canada, there are around 3,600 species of bees. Um, there are around 265 uh, bumblebee species. Um, Bombus is the scientific name for bumblebee. Um, so they're, they're relatively diverse, but on the grand scale of bee diversity, we're talking about, you know, 1% of, of the world's bees are, are bumblebees. So let's just dive in a little bit and learn a little bit about um, bumblebees. They, they do tend to be sort of the charismatic macrofauna of the bee world and, and, and sort of the entry point for a lot of people to get interested in them. And their life cycle is interesting and their behaviors are interesting. So we're just gonna spend a couple minutes here talking about um, bumblebee ecology. This here is a, is a colored map from the book Bumblebees of North America that shows the diversity uh, at a gross scale throughout North America. And, and the, the redder colors on this map represent a higher species richness and the lighter colors, uh, and, or I'm sorry, and the greener colors represent a lower species richness. So you can see in, in Northern California and along the Sierra and, and along the Cascades and through the Rockies and our mountainous areas are the areas where we have the greatest um, bumblebee diversity here in North America. So, you know, the fact that in California there, you've got a, a range of coastal to, to high mountains to desert over the course of you know, 150 miles or so provides just incredible biodiversity from a habitat perspective that, that has led to this wonderful speciation of bumblebees that we see. So it's a really important area to be looking at the bumblebee fauna and getting a better sense of, of things that are, that are happening there. Um, and in, uh, in North America, we have around 50 species of bumblebees. Um, most of those species are social colonies that are founded by a single queen. And those colonies um, last for a single year. So a queen will start a colony, and then at the end of that summer, after she's produced, hopefully produced her new queens, um, she will die. And so she lives only, only a single year. Nests can vary in size depending on the habitat quality, depending on the species of bee, depending on the length of the growing season, um, between you know, 25 workers all the way up to 500 or even over 1,000 workers, they can be quite large. What we know about nests suggests that they tend to nest in abandoned rodent burrows, in thatched grasses, sometimes on the surface of the ground, but they can also be opportunistic and nest in your, um, in your compost pile, in your backyard, or, or, or in a rock wall, wall or just in a brush pile that you leave in the corner of your yard. And just to give you some sense of what their life cycle looks like, this is a, a pamphlet from a bumblebee conservation um, pamphlet that we developed a few years ago. If you sort of think about this, this chart here as uh, the course of a year. So here is, is early spring, the, the snow is just melting from the landscape. And at that time of year, a queen would emerge from her hibernacula. So she comes out of her hibernacula, which is just a shallow burrow in the ground that she's dug herself. 
and she flies out and starts looking for a place to build a nest. And sometimes this can take a couple of weeks and you can actually observe this behavior in early spring. If you go out, you can see bumblebees fly, queens flying very low to the ground, sometimes crawling in and out of holes. Once she finds a hole that is sufficient to build her nest, she will start to um, build waxen pots and she will fill those waxen pots with pollen and nectar, um, like we talked about. And then she will actually lay her eggs directly on that pollen and nectar inside those waxen pots. And she'll continue to bring pollen and nectar into her larvae as they eat up that resource and continue to feed them and provide resources for them. Eventually, those larvae, which you see here, are worm-like animals in the early parts of their, of their life, will get big enough and they will pupate. And just like sort of a butterfly that goes through complete metamorphosis, that goes from being a caterpillar, worm-like animal, metamorphosize and emerges as a winged adult, these go through the same process. They, they pupate and they emerge um, as winged adults. And the first winged adults that come out are usually workers. And this worker cast will then take over the responsibility of bringing pollen and nectar into the nest. And the queen will mostly just lay eggs and tend to her larvae and try to keep her workers or her daughters in check. Um, later in the season, when the, the colony starts bringing in enough resources, the colony will shift from developing workers to developing the reproductive members of the colony, which would be the new queens and the males. Once males are born, males leave the nest and rarely return. They just live and sleep out in the landscape. The new queens, once they emerge, they will continue to return back to the nest each day and take advantage of the resources being brought in by the nest to build up by their fat reserves, to build up their fat reserves. They'll also find a mate out on the landscape and you know, hopefully mate. And then successfully towards the end of that life cycle, they will, after they've mated, they will um, hopefully find, dig a new hibernacula and spend the winter in the ground. And the rest of that old colony, including the males, the workers and the founder's queen will, will die off. There's also a really interesting biology. Um, uh, I, if you remember back a few slides ago, I said that most species are social animals founded by a single queen. There's actually a few sort of non-social bumblebees that are called cuckoo bumblebees that actually invade the nest of other species. Uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking into it, but this is a very interesting biology that hopefully we can get into. Leif and I um, are, are gonna co-teach a longer two hour ecology and conservation webinar in May, I believe on May 15th. Um, and we hope that you'll join us for that if you're interested in learning more details about bumblebee ecology. I think it's really important to understand and appreciate that there's a lot we don't know about bumblebee ecology, um, including like, where are species struggling? Where are they thriving? Why? <laughs> what are their specific habitat requirements? What happens with queen and male dispersary, dispersal? What's their nesting biology? What, how does reproduction work? <laughs> What, what, what's the ecology of male bumblebees? These are all relative unknowns about bumblebee biology. And this is one of the reasons that we're doing a bumblebee atlas project and why we've invited you into the fold here. Um, there are other reasons as well. We know that key pollinators, including bumblebees are declining. Several species have been proposed for endangered species listing, including four species that have been proposed for California endangered species listing. So there's a lot of species that are imperiled there's a lot of threats on the landscape, and we need to do a better job of learning where these animals are on the landscape so we can enact on the ground conservation actions to help protect them and reverse those declines. We're also lacking baseline data for most insects, but particularly for, for bumblebees. Um, well, I shouldn't say particularly for bumblebees. We're, we're lacking baseline data for invertebrates. We are definitely still lacking baseline data for bumblebees, even though we know a lot about them. So this idea of like, what does a healthy population look like? What does a healthy community of bumblebees look like? Are things that we don't fully know the answer to, and we need to do a better job doing that. And we can't detect declines or reverse recoveries if we don't have 
a baseline information that to try to return condition to. So what we're trying to do is get out on the landscape, conduct these standardized surveys that you'll be doing for the next couple of years to gather these data to help us get these baseline information so that we can move forward in a better situation and work hard on the ground to protect these animals and reverse the declines and keep pollinating diversity throughout the state of California. We've also learned over the last decade or so that community science works for gathering this information. We know that if we train a bunch of volunteers and put them on the landscape, they, they can actually bring the information that we need into us and allow us to make the conservation decisions from one place. Leaf and I would love to go out, and Dylan as well, would love to go out and sample all of California. It would be a phenomenal 10 years of, of bumblebee surveying, but it would take us that long to hit all these places. But if we can train a bunch of volunteers, get them excited to go out and help us with this work, we can get into these remote areas and learn where these animals are thriving. And you can see that all of the green dots on here are areas where we have found, or that community scientists have found the Western bumblebee, a rare species that has been proposed for endangered species listing, you know, on the landscape. These would not have been found without the community scientists out there. So that's why we're here asking you to participate in this project. And we hope that you will continue to learn more about it, get excited about it, ask us questions about it, interact with us about it, so that we can collect these data and help make California a better place for bumblebees in the years ahead. Thanks for your attention. Um, Leaf, sorry, I went a little over there, but hopefully it was worth it. <laughs> yes, thank you, Rich. Not a problem at all. I think we're on time. Um, so thank you for that great introduction. And um, let's see here. I'm going to, if you could stop sharing your screen, thank you. I will share mine. Okay. Uh, Rich, can you tell me if you see just the title slide? We're seeing your the the PowerPoint. Yeah, there you go. Now I'm seeing the title slide. You're all good. Just like this is good. Yep, you look good. Oh, now it's not good. <laughs> okay, try this. Try this. Does that look good? That looks good. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so this is module two, uh, participating in the atlas, and I'll this will take. Uh, just over an hour, 70 minutes, maybe 80 even. I'll present the first two thirds of it, and then you'll hear from Dylan. Uh, and it, I, we will probably have that short break about two thirds of the way through this module. So this one is designed to take that foundation that Rich just gave you in the ecology uh, and declines and even evolution of these animals and apply it to doing a community science bumblebee atlas. So this is the manual, this is the how-to for how to, excuse me, this is the methods for how to participate in the atlas. Um, so it's A to Z, everything you need to know. And I'll just stress that this is just about everything you need to know to, to participate in the atlas. You can, find all, you can find all of this information on our website and in our project manual as well, So which is on the website. Um, so if there's something that you wanted to get back to, you could start by going to the website. Um, uh, before I get started, uh, I wanted to just say that we have we actually have bumblebee atlases in a number of U.S. states. I think it's 15 states this spring, um, and we continue to build out this project. So we started um, a number of years ago in the Pacific Northwest, and that project led by Rich has been really successful. And it has meant that we were able to start these projects elsewhere around the nation. Our newest project is the Southeastern States Bumblebee Atlas uh, in Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. And you can see that we have many partners that we work with, not only CDFW. All right, so our current understanding of California bumblebees. We actually have a lot of data already. We, we know um, that people have been collecting bumblebees in the state for more than a century, and we've digitized a lot of that, that information from museum collections. And that's what I'm showing you here on this map. So uh, these are points of observation or collection for bumblebees around the state. The gray, light gray dots are, are uh, old uh, dots, uh, historic dots, and the orange ones are the last 20 years, roughly speaking, which are more recent. Um, and so I wanted you to just see that we've largely 
um, the, the recent data uh, does not completely cover up the gray dots, the historic data, meaning that we have not in the recent 10 to 20 years um, gone to all the historic localities where the bees occurred. And I want you to also notice that many of the, the points are aggregated around population centers and um, transportation corridors. And um, those are, that's wonderful, but uh, that is not a, a standardized uh, survey where we have information about the entire state. It's just where people chose to work. And that is why this atlas is, um, is important to us among other, other reasons. So let's get started on how to participate in the Bumblebee Atlas. Step one, you have already accomplished, which was registering for the project. And you're here for this, this training. That is a very important step. Um, but for someone at your stage, here is step one. It's to adopt a grid cell. And so you're seeing this map with um, 50 kilometer by 50 kilometer grid cells. Uh, and they're binned into three categories, depending on when in spring you can start your surveys. And this is because we, even though bumblebees are out in um, a lot of the springtime in the Central Valley as early as on the coast, um, we want your surveys to maximize the number of bees that you see and the number of species of bumblebees you see. And, and then also we don't want you to handle so many queen bumblebees that are just getting started. And so we've designed this so that hopefully when you go surveying at the appropriate time, for example, starting on March 15th or later uh, up and down the coast, um, you'll encounter worker cast bumblebees and, and some queens and maybe even some males, but you'll get a, you'll get a, a mix, not just early season queens. Um, I'll say here, uh, just a reminder, uh, if you participated in the Atlas last year, thank you so much for doing so. And I'm reminding you that you do need to re-adopt your grid cell if you wanna work in the same cell as last year, um, or if you want to do a new one, either way, go to the website and adopt your grid cell again. Um, this will just help us get a fresh list of who's doing what for this year. Um, please note that we had last year, uh, the map had some gaps in it. So we had priority grid cells and non-priority areas. And we asked you not to survey non-priority areas. We are now um, asking you to survey anywhere in the state. Um, and we've added, we backfilled those, those spaces with, uh, with numbers. Um, and so the numbers are uh, mostly sequential from upper left to bottom right, but you'll, if you see a non-sequential number as a grid cell ID code, don't worry about it, that is intentional. Um, so after you've adopted a grid cell uh, and you've gotten to the magical open season date in your area, um, you can start to do your collection. So I'm gonna lead you through how we collect bee data, how we collect habitat data, um, how we use a set of standardized methods that we'll all use in the same way so that we can create this big data set and really see what's happening around the state. Um, and of course, after all of that, you need to submit your data to universities so that I can identify your Bumblebee observations. Um, and you'll do that through Bumblebee Watch, our platform for data upload and management. Um, and I've got the website there for adopting a grid, the page of our website, um, if, uh, if you want to do that. Um, I'm going to just skip that, that map. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how to, how to use the net um, before we get into the details of the survey method. I find that many volunteers, when I meet them in the field, this is what they want to know, among other things. But they really have questions about the mechanics of swinging a net, of safely getting a bee into a vial. And um, so I want to make sure that we go over some of that here with everybody. Um, there are basically two methods for catching a bee in the net. The first one, Rich is demonstrating in the photo to the left middle, he's swinging over vegetation, right? He's swinging that net sort of horizontally and maybe a bee is, is, a, is flying away from a flower. And as he swings across her, her flight path, she gets into the back of the net. Um, this volunteer in the center and upper right-hand corner uh, she is coming right down over the top of a bee, which is foraging on a plant. So you can gently just rest your net down over the top like that. When you scare the bee, it will fly up into your net. And, either, and so just like the other method, you'll end up with a bee deep into the net. Um, we will then want you to flip the net so that the bee cannot quickly run out of the fabric. And we often tell people to hold the top of the net up as this volunteer is doing in this photo. And that's because these bumblebees will, uh, their, their predilection is to go uphill when they're, when they're uh, trying to escape from something. So they will often go straight up to the top of the net, even though you have an opening at the bottom of the net that they could easily fly away from. 
I included this photo of a very windy field day to show that um, it, it affects the bumblebees, but it also affects our ability to just swing a man. And it, it involves a bunch of um, sort of net management, which I'll skip for another time, but you get the sense that, uh, that the net is affected by, by strong wind. So once you've got a bee safely in your net, you need to transfer it to a vial. And I'm gonna just read through these steps and it may sound a little complicated. It, it's become second nature within um, maybe doing it five times. It's, it's really pretty simple, but you're gonna, um, you're gonna corner that bee in the smallest little area of net that you can safely constrain it to. And I just, I just hold the net up and let the bee walk uphill. And then I, I slowly gather up the net until I've got the bee way up in the top. Um, I then go in with a vial with no top on it. And I work that vial up into the, into the little pocket of net where the bee is caught. The bee will then fall into the vial or squirm into the vial. I then get the cap of the vial and I go in separately and I either snap it on or screw it onto the top of, of the vial, looking out for the bee's little feet, which are often in the way and you have to kind of shake it or move it around a little to get it to fall to the bottom of the vial. Um, people are often really curious about stinging and we tend um, to not talk too much about that. It is a possibility that you'll be stung, but generally speaking, we want you to understand that if you learn these survey methods and practice them, you will rarely have this problem. I think I was stung once last summer and I handled hundreds of bees, uh, maybe thousands. Uh, uh, so once you get to learn how to do this, it is really quite safe. But we do want you to understand there are real risks associated with stinging, especially if you, if you happen to be allergic. And many people don't know they're allergic until the first time they have a really bad experience. So if you think you might be, like I think I'm mildly allergic, uh, I carry an EpiPen when I go in the field, which my doctor gave me a prescription for. So um, just be aware of that. I, I will stress, I don't want you to be afraid of stinging or to worry that you, this is not for you because of the, the remote possibility of being stung. Um, it's, it's a pretty remote likelihood once you get confident in using your net. Um, and uh, you can learn so much more about all of this by meeting with us in person at a field event. And these are optional uh, events. This training workshop tonight is not optional. You have to do this to be a part of the project, but you can choose to come to one of these field events. We currently only have one on the website scheduled, but we have a whole host of them coming together. Um, I, we're gonna do at least 20 this year uh, statewide. So um, join us on a Saturday for a few hours. We'll catch bees together. We'll learn to ID them and we'll definitely practice um, swimming the net and getting bees out of the net. One more uh, just basic background thing is uh, is cooler management. Um, so we the way this works is the bee goes in the vial and the vial goes in the cooler, as you'll hear in great detail in a minute. Um, we have found that some bees are dying in coolers and um, and uh, we don't want that to happen, obviously. The reason we've had some mortality is that um, some freezers take your ice cubes down to zero or even perhaps even lower. These are just commercial home type um, chest freezers or maybe even your refrigerator's freezer. That is too cold for bumblebees. So if you freeze um, ice packs and, and ice down to zero and then you throw it in your cooler and then you throw a bee on top of that in a vial, the bee might die. And so we're asking you, try to keep your ice as close to 32 degrees as possible. Don't super chill it. Um, if you buy ice at the store, it is almost always just right. You know, just about to melt. It's not too cold at all. Um, so uh, as you practice, as you get familiar with this stuff, you'll want to look in the cooler a little bit and just make sure you think things look okay with respect to um, bees uh, not getting too cold. Let's talk a little bit about where you're going to go find these bees. So you're going to adopt a grid cell. And then within the grid cell, you are going to decide where you'll, you'll find survey sites. And this can be anywhere of your choosing. So it, you can choose a grid cell that includes your home and use your own backyard. Uh, you can ask a friend or someone else, can I go to your house? Can I go to your land and survey? As long as you get access, that's fine. Um, roadsides, uh, while there are some safety precautions, are great places to, um, public places to collect the data. Um, public lands are really important to this project. And in bold here, I've got the jurisdictions that we have permits for. So that would be national parks, national monuments, state parks, the US Forest Service lands. Uh, national Wildlife Refuges is one we're working on, we don't have yet, and the Bureau of Land Management, um, that's also in, in process. Um, we don't have permits dedicated for the other two on this list, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife's lands, 
and then county, city, or other types of local parks. And so if you want to survey in one of those places, if you want to use CDFW land, you should contact Dylan Winkler. You'll see his email in this presentation um, at CDFW. If you want to survey a county park, a city park, uh, a local park, it's uh, your responsibility to, to get in touch with park managers and ask for that permission. If you encounter roadblocks or you need um, a, a project personnel to, uh, 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 to sign off or something, get in touch with me and I will help you with it. So you're the first line of um, inquiry there, but if you hit a roadblock with getting into those parks, let me know and I will see what I can do to help you. The bottom line is you must have permission to work in the lands that you're going to survey. Um, and happily, we have access to some of the most amazing places on earth in that we have access to these public lands in California. So do consider going to our public lands to do your survey work. Um, so where should we look for bumblebees within our, um, our areas? Well, let's talk about the habitats that they like. Um, our data from 2022 suggests that the single most important type of habitat for bumblebees in California is grasslands. And this, um, this wasn't a surprise. We know this to be an important habitat type in bumblebee habit, uh, um, places where bumblebees occur around the world. Um, they tend to have more flowers and maybe a diversity of wildflowers. Uh, here in California, open canopied forests are particularly good also for bumblebees, especially at higher elevations or mid to upper elevations. Uh, riparian areas and wetlands can be quite good as they have lots of flowers. Um, and uh, the bees are obviously not interacting with the water, but uh, they will fly right out into the marsh and, and visit flowers above the waterline. Um, all sorts of coastal areas, uh, the coastal mountains with sage scrub ecosystems, um, and also developed areas. So in this grid of images here, I'm showing you some lovely native plant habitats like Carrizo Plain in the bottom, um, a high elevation Sierra Nevada place in the upper left. Um, but I've also got um, the Presidio in San Francisco there with, with some uh, non-native plants. And then also this uh, yellow star thistle, which is a non-native plant, a pernicious weed perhaps, but it is also something that bumblebees love. So don't hesitate to collect your bumblebees off of non-native plants. Just make sure to tell us that that was the plant you collected from. Um, so happily, uh, there's, there's generally no need to kill bees in order to identify them, uh, at least bumblebees. And so for this project, we use field identifications done by you, but more importantly, your photos as the voucher for the, ident for the, the fact that you saw the bee. So if you submit good enough photos to our uh, Bumblebee Watch platform, and I'm able to put a species name on them, then that becomes a durable record that the bee occurred in that place on that date. And this enters the ecosystem of data that we use to make policy and management decisions, as well as ecological restoration decisions about bumblebees in California. So your work is really um, contributing to our efforts to conserve these guys um, in a data sense. So your charge is to find those bees uh, on flowers out in the world. How are you going to do that? Well, first of all, when you choose your sites, you're going to try to find good habitat. And good habitat is one of those habitat types I just talked about that has lots of good flowers, uh, lots of flowering plants, um, we'll say. And there are certain plants that are much better than others for bumblebees. Things like this lupin here is just about as good as it gets. Um, but you'll learn about that as, as you go along. You'll need to be somewhat flexible. The first site you identify on the map may not turn out to be the best one. Um, uh, so have several in mind when you go out for the day. And if the first one turns out to be no trespassing or it's unsafe for you or there are no flowers, you could go somewhere else that you've already picked out. Um, we want you to establish a survey, survey area. We're gonna use one hectare for our point surveys and more about that in a minute. A uh, hectare is about two and a half acres. Um, so you're going to find an area of approximately that size. You're not going to put flags out or anything. You're going to eyeball that area. Um, and for roadside surveys, as we'll discuss in a minute, you'll just look for a large patch of flowers along the road um, and without a specific uh, delimiting area, as, such as one hectare. Um, we'll do a timed 45-minute survey effort for these point surveys. And that um, I'll, I'll talk about that in more detail. But this is you're gonna use a stopwatch and this will allow us to understand how many bees were collected per unit time, which is a measure of survey effort. And so that allows us to compare your work to my work and Rich's work and Dylan's work because we can divide by 45 and figure out how many bees per minute, right? 
um, you're going to look for bumblebees on all the flowers in your site. So you're going to walk slowly, look carefully. As soon as you see a bumblebee, your job becomes to catch the first bee you saw. So stop looking and start swinging. If you miss the bumblebee, it's okay. Just move on and repeat until you catch one. And when you do so, you're going to stop your, your timer and you're going to then process that bee into your net and then in, uh, sorry, out of your net into a vial and into the cooler. And then later, after your 45 minute time period, you will document each bee, as I'll describe in a minute. Um, you'll also conduct habitat information, uh, habitat survey, and collect information about the site. Um, and I'll just remind you, your photos are the single most important thing you'll bring in from the field. So good, good photos is what we need to identify the bees. And so we do want you to learn to identify bumblebees, and we want you to tell us what species you think each of them is. However, that is not the most important thing. The most important thing is for you to learn to be an excellent photographer um, and to faithfully execute the, the project methods as you go back to your survey day. Um, so when, in, in terms of time, timing, when should you look for bumblebees? Well, you saw this beautiful illustration earlier, and I'm going to use it just to illustrate seasonality here. Um, so as I said earlier, we're looking for the greatest abundance and diversity of bees, of bumblebees. And in California, there are places where bumblebees are active year round, like on the coast. Most of the coast, you can find a queen bumblebee just about any day of the year. But the survey windows for us are generally going to be March, April, and May to September 1st. Um, and that depends on whether you're in Southern California and on the coast, or you're in the Central Valley, or you're in the Northern Mountains, or the Sierra Nevada Mountains. And just, um, just so you know, in really dry years, bumblebee colonies finish sooner and the bees disappear from view for us sooner. Uh, this year is going to be a lot better than last year, I think. I'm not sure, but um, the point being, uh, think about getting your bumblebee surveys done before the, the end of August. You may be too late to find them if you're um, in a particularly dry kind of place or low elevation place. So timing does matter. Okay, so what do you need to bring in the field with you? Well, here's a, a semi-exhaustive list of equipment and personal items. Of course, any other personal items or, or equipment that you like to have with you, go ahead and bring. Um, we typically bring the field with us paper maps, uh, our data sheets, which you can print from the website, um, all sorts of field guides for identifying plants and bees, I also use online stuff like iNaturalist as a field guide. So I sometimes skip the plant field guide and I'll just, I'll just use iNaturalist sort of like a field guide in the field if I have um, cell service. Um, you'll need your net, of course. You'll need vials and that cooler. So there's a little bit of management the night before. Make sure you're, you've got ice on, on or you're, you're, you have a plan for having a chilled cooler. Um, you can use your smartphone for taking photos of these bees and generally speaking, a more recent version of whatever phone can take amazing macro photos if you know what you're doing. Um, but a better camera like the one I show in the photo here that was about $400 I think could um, take much, much better photos. So that's on you to figure out what you're gonna to use to take photos with. Um, and I just encourage you to get proficient uh, with whichever, whatever um, device you're gonna use. And we have some um, advice about that coming up. Um, any batteries or chargers that you might need, um, your personal preference for staying found. Um, many of us like to have GPS with us. I personally use my smartphone um, for, I you know, use an online app for GPS and that works for me. But have a plan so that you don't get lost. And then importantly, we're going to have a timer, right, for stopping that clock when we catch a bee. And again, for me, it's the phone, but for you, it could be your watch or, or a timer, whatever. Um, we have more project resources, as well as some ideas of where to go finding things uh, to buy uh, at this page, our project resources page on the website. We have two types of formal surveys, which are the gold standard. And in fact, only the first one is the gold standard that we really, really want you to do if you, um, as you get, get into this, and that's the point survey. Okay, so the point survey um, is going to take place in a one hectare area, as referenced earlier. Again, it's about two and a half acres. If you think in terms of football fields, that's just fewer than two and a half football fields. So get to your site, eyeball the area, decide what is one hectare. Uh, don't agonize about it too much. Um, and then you're going to walk all over that thing in the 45 minutes. You want to see every little corner. 
and visit every species of plant um, that you can find in there. You'll be doing the survey within your adopted grid cell at the survey site you chose, and you're going to catch bees, photograph bees, and then fill out a habitat assessment. Roadside surveys are slightly different. You're gonna be driving a linear uh, transect, a road. You're gonna stop um, uh, at least, uh, you're gonna se separate your stops by more than half a mile, um, and you're gonna stop five times. And each of those surveys at each of those five sites is only 15 minutes long, so much shorter surveys, but you do have to fill out the habitat assessment each time. And then when you enter your data, it's a little bit trickier than the point survey, but we can, it's not, it's not too onerous. There is another type of survey called incidental surveys, which is where you're just, you see a bee, you take a photo and you're done. And I'll talk more about those in a minute, but they are not a formal survey instrument, which is really what we want. These point surveys allow us to know so much about the communities of bumblebees that we're seeing. So what are some of the pros and cons of these point surveys? Well, um, they're longer than the roadside surveys. That's nice. We get more species. We usually get more diversity in 45 minutes than in 15. Um, we get detailed information about one place on earth. Um, the environments that we work in tend to be more naturalistic, like this restored sand dune system outside of Eureka, California. Um, uh, there are fewer logistics than, than uh, a roadside survey where you're driving and stopping and trying to be safe on the side of the road and so on. Um, the cons, well, we're just serving one point in that very large 50 kilometer by 50 kilometer grid cell. And you may miss species that just happen to not, to, to not nest near the one site that you chose. How do we plan a point survey? First thing is, please take care of yourself. We don't wanna have injuries or other unpleasantries befall our volunteers. So please think of your safety. Um, as I said earlier, you're gonna select multiple locations in your grid cell um, as candidates. And you're gonna go out there and try one and be flexible, be ready to go to another if, you, if there's some reason you can't survey at the first one. Um, and uh, just make sure that someone else knows what you're up to so that um, you'll be missed if you don't come home on time. Uh, how are we looking for bees in these point surveys? Um, well, uh, we want you to do a minimum of two of those surveys within your grid cell. That's the, that's the minimum requirement for the project. So um, you can do these on the same day in separate sites. Um, I think we say we'd like them separated by more than five kilometers. Um, you, or you can do this, this, use the same site and go back a second time or even a third time. Um, in that case, we want you to separate the surveys by three weeks or more so that we see some turnover in the community assemblage and we get a little bit of variety in what you pull out of that survey. Um, so two surveys and you can be flexible as to whether you do them both on one day or on successive different days. Um, again, the survey is 45 person minutes long. So stop your watch for all things other than swinging the net and, and searching for bees, okay? So sometimes a, a 45 minute survey takes you a, 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 an hour and 10 minutes, an hour and 20 minutes even, depending on how successful you are and whether you took a break and et cetera. Um, it's okay to do this work with friends. You can uh, adopt a good cell, each of you the same one, and you can go out together, work together on the same sites, um, but we still want 45 person minutes of effort and so that would mean if you brought one friend, you would each do 22 and a half minutes of survey work or work it out however you'd like to. If you bring three people, divide by three and so on. Um, it's better, uh, you're, it's completely fine to bring extra people, but um, a single, sur single person survey is probably the, the gold standard in terms of data rigor. And that's all I'll say about that for now. Um, so let's talk about roadside, roadside surveys, the pros and cons. Um, well, we get better spatial distribution across the landscape than we did with those point surveys. We go through different habitat types, so we get some diversity. Um, and it's generally much easier to access these places because the, the verge of the road is by its definition a public place. And um, as long as you can safely pull over and safely stand on the side of the road, um, you are allowed to be there. Um, uh, the cons, well, there tend to be a lot of invasive plants along roads. And as I said, some, there are some plants that are invasive that the bumblebees love, so not necessarily a problem, but we wanna know what bumblebees favor from natural ecosystems as well. And so with roadside surveys, we tend to get a little less of that information. Um, they're also shorter, so we may miss rare species that, that um, would just take longer before we, um, before we can finally find one. How should you plan your roadside survey? 
Well, let me emphasize again, we want you to be safe. This photo, I hope, shows enough uh, potential hazards along the side of the road from motorcycles to trucks to, to uh, pedestrians to curves. Um, this is not to be taken lightly. You can easily get yourself into trouble standing on the side of a, of a highway, right? So please be careful. Um, again, you'll set, select multiple routes, just like you would have selected multiple sites for the point survey, and you'll remain flexible about where you're going to end up doing the actual survey. Um, and again, make sure to respect private property ownership and know that someone knows where you're going to be for the day. All right, so how do we do a roadside survey? Well, again, it's about 10 miles long. There will be five stops, and you're going to separate those stops by at least a half a mile. Each survey is 15 minutes long. And again, you're going to fill out that habitat survey. So uh, the, the roadside survey is gonna be a little bit more uh, um, note-taking. Every 15 minutes, you'll be filling out a full habitat survey, whereas you just do one for the whole 45 point survey. Um, and again, uh, we want the net number of person minutes being 15. So you will pause your watch, your timer for all of these things like transferring bees to coolers, taking a break to drink some water, et cetera. Uh, let's talk about those incidental observations. Well, these are the ones uh, where you're just, you're just walking along, or you're, you're in your backyard, you're doing something else, whatever, and you see some bumblebees. Uh, and you just whip out your phone and take some photos as I did here. Um, and so we want you to submit just a photo of a bee, just that simple. There's no habitat survey that you have, uh, a habitat field form you have to fill out. It's very quick and dirty. Um, these are these are sort of for me. They're, they tend to be casual, walking down the street kind of things, and they're very opportunistic um, because I'm usually doing something else when I end up taking these photos. Um, despite this uh, this casual nature of uh, the, the incidental observations, we do still need high quality photos. So it's fun to try to get in focus photos of bees flying, as I have here. But sometimes they're pretty pictures, but they're not great ID photos, and that would be a good um, description of this one. I think I know what species it is, but I, I'm not quite sure because the photo is not quite good enough. Um, these photos will be uploaded to Bumblebee Watch, um, similar to the way we do uh, the point, survey, point surveys and roadside surveys. Um, and we have some photography tips on our website that uh, are linked here. So there are some pros and cons. Well, uh, the pros of uh, these incidental surveys is you can do it any time. It's very little time to take a picture. Some of my favorite photos that I've taken, I took well in my left hand was holding a child and in my right hand was holding the phone and <laughs> taking photos. Um, you can do this just about any place that, uh, that you're outside and bees are flying. Um, there's no time minimum. Um, the photos can give really interesting ecological context. For example, when a bee meets an unhappy end, as in this photo, um, it's just an interesting datum. It's just something we know about the bees that they have predators at flowers. And, and you've demonstrated this if you bring in a flower, like, a photo like that. Um, on the con side, well, we have no measure of survey effort. We don't know how, how long your, your nature walk was before you took the photo. There's more bias. You, you, I, I chose to take this picture because I thought it was really gnarly. <laughs> and that's me biasing the outcome of the survey, right? Um, and also we have no description of habitat here. We just have a bee, a photograph of a bee out of place at a time. All right, we're gonna move into some safety stuff for the bees. Um, regardless of what type of survey you're doing, if a bee is going into a vial, you need to have sterilized or cleaned your vials and their lids before hitting the field. Um, the best way to do that, I think, is 10% bleach. It kills everything. Um, I make a 10% bleach solution, soak them for a half an hour, maybe 45 minutes, then I drain it off and rinse them several times, and then I sun dry them. Um, you can use 70% ethanol and either spray it in there or, or dunk them in it. Um, hydrogen peroxide is, is acceptable. And if you don't want to or don't have those things, um, you can just use hot soapy water um, and a good, a good manual scrubbing, rinsing, and drying. Now, uh, when bees are in vials, this stuff is important. The next three things I'm going to say, we don't want you to have the bee at ambient temperature for any more than five minutes. So when you get a bee in a vial, if you carry it around in your pocket, or if you hold it up to the sunlight for more than a few minutes, you're going to see that bee starting to look sweaty. And before long, the bee will be looking uh, in a coma. And <laughs> before long, it'll be dead. So please uh, take the bee to the cooler and put the vial in the cooler. That's, that's the way to 
um, within about five minutes. That's the way to keep the bees alive. Now, um, once the bee is in the cooler, you're okay. That bee is, she's gonna stop moving. She's gonna slow down her respiration and she's absolutely fine there. But we don't want you to keep them in coolers any longer than two hours or 120 minutes, okay? So that's rarely going to happen in, with our survey, survey methodology, but that's what we want you to remember. Two hours would be the limit for a live bee in a vial in a cooler. And then when we release the bees, we don't have to release each bee exactly on the flower that we took it from, but we want you to release all the bees within 100 meters of where you collected those bees. And that just means anywhere in the hectare, basically. So you do your work, you, you fill up the cooler, then you go sit in a shady spot and, release, and do this um, data collection. And I just release the bees there, and I'm usually within 50 meters of where the bee was collected. Okay, so those details are important to us. The five minutes uh, at ambient temperature, the 120 minutes in um, the cooler, and the fact that we want you to um, release the bees within 100 meters of where you caught them. I wanna talk a little bit about photography here. Um, as, as I said before, photography is the number one most important thing for you to get good at, to make real contributions to this, uh, to this project. So all photos should include um, a, a look at the hind leg, which is um, important for understanding whether it's a cuckoo bumblebee or a cypress species, um, as Rich discussed, or it's the non-cuckoo bumblebee type that would have a corbicula on the hind leg, a pollen basket on the hind leg. Um, we use this also for distinguishing males from females because only uh, females of non-cuckoo species have a corbicula. Um, we want photos of the head, um, including the cheek area, which you'll see um, in a second in another photo, um, and the color of the hair on the front of the face and the top of the head. Um, we want to see the thorax, and the thorax is that middle section that the wings are attached to and all three sets of legs are attached to. In this bee, it's very yellow in the front of it and in the back of it, and it's got some black hair in the middle of it. And ideally, we want to see all three of those areas, as well as below the wings, where you can see a lot of yellow hair on this bee. And then on the abdomen, we want to be able to see those segments. And with this bee, you can, see, you can actually count them, right? You can see the slices between the segments that are, that are partially overlapping each other. And we wanna be able to understand what is the color of the hair on, on each of these segments. Then if the bee has these two characteristics, a yellow face and a single yellow stripe on the abdomen, but is otherwise for the most part black, that bee, we would like to also see the underside of the abdomen because there are characteristics there where we wanna see the hair color on a certain particular segment. Um, so more detail about is um, Bombus fervidus, uh, one of our species, and you can see what we want to see on the head. So at the base of the antenna, that is called the face, right where the antenna attached to the head, we call that the face. We want to see the hair color on the face. We also want to see the hair color at the top of the head, or what we call the vertex, right where it attaches to the thorax, and we want to see that cheek. Now for the thorax, as I said, we want to see all areas of the thorax, the sort of front, middle, and back, as well as under the wing bases. Um, we want you to note whether there is a circular spot on the top of the thorax, or is it instead a band connecting the two wing bases? Is there a notch of some sort where that the black hair in the middle of the thorax trends backward towards the abdomen? And then on the abdomen, we want you to be able to count uh, those, those segments. Those, those, um, they're called tur turgites, and uh, plural, that's turga. So we abbreviate them T1, T2, T3, and so on. We want you to be able to say T3 is all yellow, but T5 on this animal is black. Um, and we'll talk more about that tonight. Uh, and then um, in some cases, there's going to be more than one color on a, tur a turgite or some other body part. And we want you to be able to, to describe that. Is the hair mixed in so you have dark and light hairs together? Like, a, like an aging human uh, head? <laughs> or do you see a patch of red hair in the center of the segment and yellow on the side? Separate colors of hair um, on, the same, on the same segment. After you've taken your lovely photos and you're ready to let that bee go, but you still have the bee in hand, please look at your photos and ask yourself, are these good enough? So we want clear in-focus photos. You'll, you'll have up to four to submit and they need to show these various parts of the body in good focus. Um, one thing I like to ask myself is first about the, the lighting. How's the light 
How's the focus? And then um, really importantly, can I see individual hairs? And if I can see individual hairs, um, I can actually say, what is the color of the hair on a particular segment? Um, if I can't quite make out individual hairs, like the second from the left photo, um, on thorax, I see some dark hair and some light hair, but I'm not sure if it's mixed or if um, there's shadow in the front part and it's actually all yellow, but it, it's just a little shadowy. So you, you don't have to be a professional wildlife photographer or have that skill level, but um, we want you to think critically about your own photos. And um, don't worry about it if you, if you have one that's just terrible, um, you'll get better with practice, but um, make this one of your, your goals for the project to, to make yourself a better macro photographer. Um, and it's perfectly all right to have pens and fingers and other things in the photo. Um, these photos are not meant to be beautiful uh, so much as they're meant to be diagnostic. And so this person is spreading the wings so that we can see a brown patch of hair just in the center of the second abdominal tergite. Um, something we couldn't see with the wings folded over it, right? And so that, we want you to do that. We want to see your fingernail if necessary. Um, so a summary of how to survey for bumblebees uh, as a member of the California Bumblebee Atlas. Well, um, we've talked about incidental observations. Um, they are tricky. It's hard to get good photos. Um, and so be patient with yourself. Take lots of photos and throw away most of them. Um, live bees moving on flowers, it's, uh, it's a, it, there is a learning number, and I'm going to leave it to you to figure out how to get better at that. It's actually quite fun. Um, for point and roadside surveys, we're going to be catching that bee in the net. We're going to be putting it in the vial. We're going to be transferring the vial to the cooler um, with ice. Um, the bee will be anesthetized by at least by 20 minutes in the cooler. And again, you can have it in there for up to two hours. Um, uh, and we want you to take really detailed photos, and we want you to release the bee within 100 meters of the capture location. Now I'm going to go through the data sheets uh, that you are going to use in the field, the field form that you will write on to uh, record your field data. And um, they have changed ever so slightly since last year, but these slides depict last year's field form. All the content is there, it's the same, but the boxes will shift just slightly when you see the actual form for 2023. Um, but this is roughly what it looks like. And so you'll go ahead and just fill this in. So you will make up a site name. Um, and this one, I, I just picked a spot on the map and made up a site name. The, uh, I named it after the road that it was on, this Pedrick Road. Um, I record the grid cell ID, which you can get from our website. Um, and you will have selected your grid cell and adopted it and you'll probably have the number memorized. We want to know the date, um, what type of survey you're doing. We want to know some stuff about the weather conditions. Um, we want latitude and longitude, as you see here in the second row um, there. And really important, we want that to be digital. So, di uh, sorry, decimal <laughs> um, uh, uh, latitude and longitude, not um, minutes, degrees, second, sorry, degrees, minutes, seconds. So uh, we want to see uh, numbers to the right of the decimal point like this. Um, this, it makes the data play nice with all the other records and um, it's the most efficient way to map our records. <clears throat> we have uh, a couple of other fields that are self-explanatory here. Um, we ask you to record any notes that you may have. And then we ask for your bumblebee observations. This is the bumblebee uh, survey data sheet. So you'll take a photo of the first bee, and then you'll say, I think it's Bombus fervidus, and you'll write that here. Um, you'll write the host plant species. I think it was a lupin, but I don't know what species. And then you'll tell us which photos did you take of that bee, and perhaps of its flower. And so I've, I've illustrated a couple different ways to do this. You can say photo number 127, um, if your camera is attributing each photo like that, and you can easily find those numbers. Um, my system is a little different. I like to put the time, the exact time that I took the photos. So maybe I take five or 10 photos of one bee, and then I look at the, the time on my phone, and I just record that time, the last, the minute of the last uh, photo I took. So later, when I want to marry the photos to um, the data sheet and get all of this into Bumblebee Watch, it's really easy to find my photos based on date and time. And, um, and the, they're, they'll all be in sequence of the same individual bee every few seconds, right? Um, so uh, there is some flexibility in how you keep track of your photos, um, but believe me, it's, uh, it can be confusing to return to your data weeks or even months later 
and try to figure out what photo number 127 means. So please come up with a system that works for you and also upload your data uh, um, as soon as you can after coming back from the field. Um, so here's, uh, here's what the um, uh, habitat assessment form looks like. We've got a bunch of the same information up at the top. Um, we wanna know, uh, let's just skip down to the bumblebee survey information line. Ooh, uh, sorry, there. Uh, and you can see it's a survey method. method. Um, we wanna know, did you try to capture all bees? Um, which is the default setting. We'd like you to try to capture every bumblebee you see without prejudice as to what type of bumblebee it looks like. Um, but if you're, a, a, if you're starting to get accomplished at this and you are getting good at bumblebee ID and you wanna find the rare stuff, um, you can instead just catch one of all the common things and then just keep looking for rare stuff. And that would be the, the, different, uh, the different option here. You can select different bees. That's not a great choice for beginners because um, there's a lot of nuance and ideas you'll learn later uh, tonight. And um, um, so you might assume that you have one of every common species, but in fact, there are some other common species that look just like the ones you already have and you're missing them. So I would encourage you to, to circle all here and just catch every bumblebee you see, um, unless you feel confident to do the other, the other thing. Um, we wanna know, is it a point or roadside survey? Um, skipping down here to the habitat information, we ask you to circle the habitat type, and we've constrained you to just a few, um, seven different types, and they're pretty self-explanatory, um, and you'll circle that habitat type, and then um, on the right side of that, you can see where it's a surrounding area, and we want you to, to tell us what uh, habitat types were surrounding the, um, the place where you um, did your survey. So if you were out in a meadow and it's surrounded by forest, you will write uh, woodland slash forest at number one there. Uh, moving on on the same form, so you can see uh, what I was just talking about at the top now, um, how much of the survey area has flowering resources available? We want you to estimate the percent cover of flowers in your one hectare. You're going to do this by eyeballing it. You're not going to take out a, a transect tape and, and do any measurements of this. Um, so do your best to figure out the percent cover of flowers in the site. And then um, the next thing is nesting habitat. We wanna know about um, aspects of the habitat for nesting that you may see. This would include, because bumblebees generally nest underground, it includes things like the presence of bunch grasses, rodent holes, piles of brush, bare soil, leaf litter, uh, pine needles, and a duff layer that you might have in a pine forest, or big piles of rocks. Next, we will have a management section. We want you to tell us if you see or do not see or suspect that something like one of these things might be present. And that includes mowing, um, grazing by livestock, grazing by native animals, agriculture, insecticides and herbicides, and, and other things here. We're asking you to tell us if you see honeybee hives um, and record the number. I'll tell you, you were, uh, in most surveys, you're not gonna see any honeybee hives, but uh, I would invite you to tell us in the notes field there if you see honeybees themselves. Um, we don't have a, a, a thing to circle for that, but that is useful information. Um, and then finally, uh, on the back side of that, we're recording all of the plant species. And so um, I previously showed that you're recording the bees and the plant that the bee was on. Well, here we're recording just the, all the plants that you see in the site. Um, and if you know the species, please give us that. And if you don't, uh, you'll write the common name or you'll write yellow flower or something like that. And you're again going to use timestamps or photo numbers to, um, to remind yourself of which, which photos represent which um, mystery plants. And with that, uh, I think we should take a quick five minute break um, and really just five minutes and we'll get right back to it. And you'll hear again from me for five to 10 minutes and then Dylan will take it from there. So um, with that, uh, let's say we will come back at um, 7.22, okay? Thank you.
Okay. Um, my watch the 723, let's get in again. So again, I will talk for approximately uh, 10 minutes and then you will hear from Dylan. Just, there we go. All right, so I'm not gonna talk about um, how to enter your Bumblebee and Habitat data to Bumblebee Watch. So all data, as I've said, is going to be entered at bumblebeewatch.org. You'll need to make an account there um, and you'll log into your account in order to access it and um, and uh, upload your data. Um, as I said earlier, it's a good idea to enter your field data as soon as possible after your field surveys um, uh, for just the reasons of organization and remembering the, the, the details of, uh, of the work that you did. Um, we'll be keeping good record of our photos, as we've discussed, of, of our uh, materials, like our, our uh, field data sheets, um, keeping, keeping those things organized. Um, you're gonna take, probably take more than four photos uh, of, of each bee. And again, just submit the four best photos or most useful photos, useful from the, the standpoint of, of identification as, as we've discussed. Um, we do want a, a fifth photo of a host plant if possible. And so here you see that I collected this bee off of uh, uh, Erythranthi, or um, used to be called Mimulus um, species there in the yellow flower on the left. I included a photo of the plant itself with that record. So I'm going to lead you through some screen grabs from Bumblebee Watch so that you get a sense of what it looks like. This is the landing page. And when and you can see in the upper right hand corner, it says sign in and sign up. Uh, those are self-explanatory, I think, but you need to be signed in to upload your data. So that's the first step, sign in there to the account that you will have created previously. Then you click record a sighting and you see this drop down menu that says bumblebee sighting and nest sighting. So this is this is you're about to enter your first point survey data, let's say. So you're going to choose record a sighting and then you're going to click bumblebee sighting there. Right there. We're then going to go to this page, which is where we enter data about the site where you saw the bee. Um, if it's a point survey or a roadside survey, this is very important, this project field, we want you to, to attribute it as California Bumblebee Atlas. And in fact, when you make your projects, uh, sorry, when you make your personal login, uh, your account, um, it's gonna ask you, do you wanna specify a default project? And I would suggest that you specify this one. So it'll automatically populate as California Bumblebee Atlas as your project. Um, as you'll hear, uh, when it's incidentals that you're uploading, we don't want to hear, we don't want you to put California Bumblebee Atlas here. We want you to put Bumblebee Watch instead. And this is a drop down menu, so you'll just scroll to Bumblebee Watch and select that instead. So for roadside surveys and point surveys, you're in the California Bumblebee Atlas. For incidental sightings, please name it uh, the project as Bumblebee Watch. Um, scrolling down the same page, this is just what you see at the bottom half of the same page, there is a map. Um, and uh, you can scroll around and find your location. Um, if you have already been entering data and you've gone back to the same site, uh, you can start typing the name of that site where it says select a previous location and it will bring up a list of possibilities from your menu of previous uh, data entries. Um, and then if you don't have a previous location, you're gonna, you're gonna come up with a site name. So uh, I, this one is called Pedrick Road Dixon. Um, I just made that up, and again, made this up based on this road I found in the town of Dixon. Um, I'm going to put my decimal uh, degree, longitude, and latitude in the right boxes. And um, remember that longitude in California has a negative sign at the start of it. So if you enter 121.804244, that will put you in China uh, or in the, in the sea off of China. So you, we need that negative um, sign to get you to California. So please try to remember that. When you're done with this page, there's a, there's a button to click at the bottom to uh, proceed to where we are going to upload. Oops, sorry, one more page, one more part of this page. Um, uh, as we scroll down, you're gonna add the rest of the data from the, the habitat data sheets. So, um, you're gonna say that it's a point survey, if in fact it was. This is a drop-down menu. Um, you're going to tell us if you caught all the bees you saw or if you did that thing where you just tried to find novelties. Uh, you'll tell us if it's one hectare or some other area that you surveyed. 
If your area is smaller than a hectare because that's the way it's configured, that's fine. Um, you can use different areas. We just suggest that one. Um, we want to know the number of people who surveyed. We want to know the time you started and then the time you ended. And we want to know the total net number of survey minutes, which you'll recall is supposed to be 45. So even if in this example, in this example, 45 minutes elapsed between the start time and the end time, but it's typical that more than 45 minutes will elapse because you're stopping your watch over and over, right? So these are two different things. We want to know start and finish time, and we also want to know the number of minutes you are actually working on catching bees, the survey minutes being 45. Um, okay, uh, there's some other self-explanatory stuff here that comes right off those data sheets, and I'm going to move on to the next uh, page. Um, so scrolling down on that same page, we see more um, uh, boxes that come directly from the data sheets. So there's a drop down menu for each of the so called management things. So, did you see mowing? Did you see insecticide use? And so on. You'll just choose no, yes, or suspect. Um, and then we have management notes. Um, I put all sorts of things in this field to remind myself later that um, it was, it started to rain, or I saw some strange bumblebee, or there were a lot of honeybees, or these kinds of things that might be valuable later um, to people trying to interpret the data. Um, I told you earlier we wanted to record all the flowers, the plants that are flowering in the site, whether or not bumblebees are visiting. Um, and so that's what you'll do here. And then finally, you're going to click through to the screen where we're uploading uh, the photos of the bees and the host plant. So here, it's pretty self-explanatory, but you can drag and drop photos to the gray rectangle that says drag photos here, or you can click to navigate um, with, to uh, the location on your computer. Then you're going to um, you're going to upload at least you're going to upload four bee photos and one uh, flower photo. Then you're going to choose the species identification where it says bifarious. That was my guess for this bee. You're going to tell us if it was a worker, a queen, or a male, and you're going to tell us what the flower was and how many of those bees you saw. In general, one uh, it'll be one bee that you saw and you took four photos of. In some cases, we'll be counting uh, 10 bees because we're doing that thing where uh, sometimes for expert users of the system, we're counting the bees of the same species. And so I would just take photos of one bee, but tell, tell the system that there were 10 of them. I don't recommend this for beginners, but it is an option once you get good at Bumblebee ID. And that is the basics for Bumblebee Watch. After this, um, you are done with that record. Um, you can then choose to add an, another bee and another bee and another bee as nested parts of the, the habitat, the site, uh, the site information that you entered on the previous screen. So uh, to summarize, what do we need to do to complete a survey? Well, we need to adopt that grid cell. Remember, even if you're a returning volunteer, we want you to re-adopt that grid cell. Um, plan your work before you go out. Choose multiple sites that might work for you and go out and conduct your, conduct your survey solo or with your friends and family. Um, and then you're gonna enter your data to Bumblebee Watch. It's simple, right? <laughs> um, we have an array of resources to help you, to guide you as you do this work. Um, on the website, you'll find all of this material except for the Facebook uh, group that you, uh, you see there. We have a private Facebook group that we use for talking about identification or project uh, challenges or any, anything you wanna talk about related to the projects. Um, sometimes volunteers find each other there and decide to survey together. So it's a you know, social media, social way to <laughs> find other volunteers. Um, and uh, so I encourage you to go to the website and explore the project manual and the other resources that we have there. Um, and then quickly, here are some identification resources that you might find useful. Um, spoiler alert, the book on the left, I'm a co-author, so I'm, I'm recommending it, but, um, but I'm biased. I think it's a good book. <laughs> Um, it's a good uh, field guide to the bumblebees of North America. It's the, the best available resource for identifying bumblebees. Um, there is a free uh, PDF you can download from the internet called Bumblebees of the Western United States. Um, and that one is, is very good also. That's a good place to start if you don't want to buy the book. Um, and then there are a number of online resources that can really help you. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner, we see a screenshot from bugguide.net 
where experts are identifying uh, submitted photos of bees and other insects. Um, and at the bottom, you see Bumblebee Watch uh, and iNaturalist, which is a really great resource if you're not familiar with it, um, for learning more about bees, their host plants, and other organisms. Oh, and finally, this is for the power user. Um, this is a 1983 publication by uh, one of our colleagues who uh, is no longer with us, and it is a wonderful um, field guide, uh, or guide to the bumblebees of California. It's out of date, um, and it's a little bit incomplete because we've learned new things, but it is a great resource that you can find online if you so choose to get a little bit more rigorous and sciencey with this project. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dylan Winkler, who's gonna talk about environmental compliance issues with the project. And I'll be advancing slides, so Dylan, just give me a heads up, and I will do that. Thank you, Leif. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sounds good. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Dylan again, and I'm a scientific aide with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife in Sacramento. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about the environmental compliance actions we need to take to ensure we minimize any potential harm to the bees. Uh, the plants and habitat we'll be serving on and ourselves. Um, if you took this training last year, uh, some of this will be the same, but there are a few dif differences too. The sections I'll cover include the Eagle Act, uh, Eagle Protection Act, uh, avoiding sensitive habitats while surveying, uh, other precautions while you're out in the field, the requirements of our new uh, Memorandum of Understanding and Scientific Collecting Permit, and why those uh, permit conditions are important for preventing the spread of disease. All right, Leif. So starting with eagles, uh, both bald and golden eagles are protected in uh, California and uh, the United States, um, and both species occur statewide. So we want to ensure that our atlas surveys do not negatively impact them. Eagles incubate their eggs and fledge their young during the prime bumblebee surveying season. Um, and loud noises or pro prolonged human presence can cause them to abandon their nests. So while you're out surveying, if you happen to encounter a golden eagle nest during their breeding season, um, please move to a new site that is at least one mile from that location. Golden eagle nests are commonly found on cliffs, but they can also be on human structures or in trees as well. And for bald eagles, um, you don't have to move as far, about 330 feet or the length of a US football field. Uh, and bald eagle nests are usually uh, made of uh, sticks or branches and high tree tops. Uh, it might be hard to know whether an eagle is at the site uh, you're surveying. Um, so always try to have a backup location or two when you're out, just in case you happen to encounter a nest. Also, if you uh, have time uh, before surveying, check with the local office uh, or agency of, that owns the land you're on to see if there are any active eagle nests or other sensitive resources in the area um, that you should be aware of. You're also welcome to contact me too, and I can look up any info on nests nearby. Um, and if you do find an eagle nest while you're out surveying, please report it to uh, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, hopefully, uh, at least, uh, well, up to three days after you survey, so we can enter it in our database. Okay, Leaf. Oh, yeah, and that's the main survey season. Um, all right, uh, along with eagles and wildlife, uh, we don't want to negatively impact any ecosystems or habitats while we're out collecting bumblebee data. The survey methodology of uh, photo documentation was specifically designed to have a low impact, um, which is why this project relies on just pictures of bumblebees and flowers instead of specimens. However, uh, when you're out sampling, it's always important to be mindful of the area you're in, especially when you're working in uh, sensitive habitats like wetlands, uh, riparian areas, um, or any, any places with rare or listed species. Like I said in the previous slide, uh, the best practice would be to reach out to a local uh, agency or, or office to see if there's any, anything you should be aware of. Next slide.
So the most important lesson from uh, this talk will be to make sure you're safe when you're out. Uh, Leaf already mentioned this, but I want to reiterate it. If you're going out alone, try to let someone know uh, what your travel plans are, including when you plan to return so they can check in on you. Be sure to consult with uh, locals about road surfaces and, and don't rely solely on GPS or uh, mapping software for traveling. For example, there's a lot of forest service roads where the, the condition of the dirt roads can be sketchy even for four wheel drive. So make sure uh, you know if roads require high clearance uh, or four wheel drive. Uh, please also use extra care when sampling along roadsides during those, those roadside surveys Leaf mentioned. Um, just be aware of blind corners and don't survey along really busy uh, freeways and highways. Uh, Leaf also mentioned that uh, it's important, uh, well, it's critical to have permission uh, for the areas that you're going to be sampling on. Unless a private landowner gives you access, please stay to the rights of way or on public land. Um, however, do note that many public lands require permitting, um, and uh, some of them we can provide permits for uh, if you're interested in specific properties. We're especially interested in serving Bureau of Land Management lands this year, um, and we will provide a letter of access for all trained participants. In addition, we're applying for several national park permits this year, um, even more than last year. So look forward to coordinating with us if you're interested in a specific park. Also, uh, if you're interested in uh, CDFW lands, which are ecological reserves and wildlife areas, uh, please contact me and I can hopefully get you a letter of access. We would love to have more data on what bumblebees are out there uh, on our properties. Next slide. So the difference uh, this year is that uh, there are four bumblebee species in California that are now candidate species on the California Endangered Species Act, or CESA. Um, any research that impacts these species requires a CESA Memorandum of Understanding, or MOU. Um, we have a, uh, a letter that details this MOU that uh, trained participants will get once they pass the quiz at the end of this training, um, or when they take it. Um, and that MOU covers the four species that are listed on screen here, uh, Franklin's, Western, Crotches, and Suckley's Cuckoo Bumblebee. And on the next slide, um, in addition to these uh, CISA listed species, um, there are two more that are covered under the scientific collecting permit that Xerces holds. Um, any research that impacts uh, the CDFW's list of terrestrial invertebrates of conservation priority um, requires a scientific collecting permit. Um, all of these species, the, the four previous candidates and these two, uh, Morrison's and Obscure Bumblebee, um, are considered species of greatest conservation need. And there, there's a lot of terms with these permitting, um, but basically uh, these six species are uh, have special stat status in California um, and to handle them for this project, you need these permits. The purpose of these permits is to develop a set of conditions that will help ensure that these species are not harmed as the result of our research process. And it also should be noted that there are other pollinator species on this conservation list that you might incidentally capture in your surveys. It's unlikely, but it could happen. Uh, we don't expect you to ID any other pollinator species, but um, just try to handle all things that you catch in a careful and cautious way. Okay, big slide. Um, we're working under Xerces active scientific collecting permit for the California Bumblebee Atlas. In order to be added to that permit, uh, you must adhere to a set of agreed upon conditions. First, getting the proper training, which is the webinar today. Uh, then you'll need to pass a short quiz um, that we'll uh, post, and it's also on our website, that shows you've demonstrated um, key understanding of the survey protocol and how it was designed to minimize impacts to bumblebees. It's good to review some of the permitting conditions I'll go through now, but uh, once you're approved 
um, you should read through the whole permit to ensure that you understand them. You're also required to carry the uh, SCP and the MOU with you, either in physical form printed out or in, uh, on your phone digitally uh, when you're out sampling. Um, also, for the quiz, um, once you take it, uh, Xerces will tell you if you pass or not, and then provide uh, me and the department with a list of approved officials to add to the permit. Uh, you should get an, an email with the permits notifying you that you've been added, and then you can start surveying. Uh, another note, if you took this training last year and already passed the quiz, it's the same quiz, um, you are technically already on the permit and uh, all you need is to be emailed the MOU letter, which we'll do soon. Um, there's no need to take the quiz again. Uh, going down this list here, uh, one of the key parts of the permit is that it does not authorize the killing um, or take of the six special status bumblebee species. As you'll learn in the next section, um, where Leaf will talk about ID, some of the species can be really hard to tell apart. Thus, it's imperative to work with care when handling all bumblebees. Um, again, if you, uh, uh, well, during this protocol, uh, we're trying to be non-invasive and minimize harm whenever we catch a bee. If you accidentally catch a different bee species, which happens a lot, or even a fly, um, be sure to release it after years you've secured your target species. Also, if you think you can identify any of the six uh, special status bees, um, which is not a requirement of participating. You don't, you don't have to ID the bees. Um, that's why we have LEAF to identify our bees for us on Bumblebee Watch. Um, but if you think you've caught an SGCN species, please let us know within three days. Um, we may reach out uh, for more information too. Other compliance needs um, are equally as important and those include what Leaf talked about with sanitization, cleaning your equipment between sampling locations. Uh, I really want to reiterate that we do not want to spread pathogens or disease to new locations due to our survey effort. Another example of why it's important to sanitize your equipment is on the next slide, um, rabbit hemorrhagic disease, uh, RHDV2. Um, you might have heard about this in the news. It's relatively recent in the last few years in the United States, but um, rabbit hemorrhagic disease is a virulent and highly contagious viral disease of rabbits uh, and hares and, and pica. Um, and uh, this disease is, has a high mortality rate. Um, up to 80% of populations have been killed because of this disease. Um, it can be uh, transmitted through contact from infected uh, rabbits. Um, and it's really hardy. It can remain viable for like up to 15 weeks. Um, but it's important to note that it doesn't pose a health risk to humans, to us, or any other animals besides rabbits and hares. Um, but we can inadvertently spread it. So the number one rule with uh, serving is do not touch uh, rabbits or hares or dead rabbits or hares if you if you come in contact with them. Uh, the department considers three or more rabbit mortalities in the same area to be unusual, uh, or one or more freshly dead rabbits with no obvious cause of death or bleeding from the mouth or nose. So if you observe um, those unusual events, we ask that you report them to our wildlife health lab, uh, the mortality report, um, so we can know when there is a, a documented case. And if you see on this little map on the side, um, from October through December, there were confirmed cases of this disease in the uh, Sacramento Valley and uh, the Northern Bay area. So it's a, it's a great little resource, this USDA map, to check if there's any um, local cases in your area when you're out surveying. But the number, but the, sorry, one more thing. Um, if you do encounter uh, a rabbit that is, dead and you don't know how it died, try to um, clean all of your gear that touched the ground and especially disinfect your boots with a fresh 10% bleach solution. Okay. Um, 
Some additional uh, conditions of the permit uh, is salvage, which is our term for collecting an already dead uh, bumblebee specimen. Um, you're allowed to salvage bumblebee specimens if you find uh, them already dead. Uh, first, we ask you to photograph the bee so we get a sense of its condition, then report the uh, latitude and longitude of where it was found, as well as uh, the date, time, and other relevant details of when you collected it, uh, including the probable cause of death, if you can venture a guess. Then you'll want to put it in the freezer and notify uh, Xerces or CDFW, and hopefully we can provide you with more information. And we really hope you don't find too many dead bumblebees when you're out surveying too. If you note like a mass poisoning, definitely let us know. And we may also need to report it to the wildlife health, health lab. Uh, accidental take, if you accidentally kill a bee in the course of this work, which Leaf mentioned did happen a couple times last year, uh, you need to report this to us. That's a permit condition. You need to stop surveying in the location you are in, which is defined as two miles from um, the point you're at, until you uh, and don't continue survey work there until you hear back from CDFW. Okay, one final note. If you are sampling in Siskiyou and Trinity counties in Northern California, uh, you may, although uh, aren't too likely, uh, encounter Franklin's bumblebee, which was listed as federally endangered in 2021. We are really hoping to rediscover this bee. We say this every year, um, but we really hope to find it again because it'll really help uh, recovery efforts for this species. Um, please remember that the protocol, wherever you're serving, was designed to minimize harm. So carefully follow it, but don't be afraid to sample in these locations um, if you can. And on this part of Bumblebee Watch, if you should find Franklin's, um, our permit condition states that we do not publicize this. Um, so when you're uploading uh, your records, there's a little box at the bottom circled in red marked private. Please click this box um, and also don't share the news of the finding on social media or in, in the news. Just contact uh, Leaf uh, Rich. Or, or the CDFW department. Okay, uh, that wraps up my section on compliance. Sorry, I went a little long. Uh, please reach out to me or my supervisor, Hilary Sardinias, if you have any questions. And here's a couple links for uh, permitting if you want more info. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dylan. Okay, um, we are running short on time, so I'm going to move right along to the last module, um, and I need to share my screen again. So now we're going to talk about bumblebee identification. And as I said, we are running a little bit late. I predict I'm going to go over time by about five to ten minutes here. I think I'm going to just keep right on talking. If you have to leave, I'm very sorry that we are... Um, off schedule here, but you will be able to see this on YouTube or through our website in about a week. Um, and so we'll just preserve the full the full talk so that we, um, we we can go back to that if we'd like to. So this is about identifying California's bumblebees. Um, we've we've made it through the introduction, the ecology, and some of the declines information. We've talked all about how to participate in the atlas and um, how to deal with environmental compliance issues. Um, and now we'll just get into we some identification stuff. We can see your whole slide deck right now, not the presentation, just so you know. Thank you. How's that? Perfect. Okay. All right, you saw this, this picture of this man before. I wanted to just highlight uh, Robin Thorpe, who is the author of that one uh, reference that I mentioned for power users that, that Rich dropped in the chat. Um, he, one of the co-authors of that, that uh, document. Um, he's been a mentor to some of us and just a wonderful um, scientist, California bumblebee taxonomist, who has published some really seminal work about these bees. And so um, I know Rich feels this way and I feel this way too. We, we feel indebted to people like Robin and we want to make sure everyone understands that we should stand on the shoulders of, of the people who came before us with respect to um, what we're up to here. So um, the many interesting people who have contributed to what we know about California's bumblebees. 
Before talking in depth about the identification, we need to cover some morphology. And we've covered some of this already uh, this evening. I'm gonna start at the very top of this graphic where it says face, and I'll go clockwise around the animal. Um, so again, there's a head, a thorax, and, a, and an abdomen. So starting at the head, the face is the, is the hair uh, at the base of where the antenna attach. Um, so we wanna see the color of that hair right, um, right where the antenna come out of the head. That's called the face. Um, the antenna are broken into the scape and flagellum. You will sometimes hear those terms, although they're not used very often in identification at the level that we're doing it. Um, the head is the whole thing. Uh, the vertex is that, is that area of hair at the top of the head that faces the thorax, and it's yellow in this image. Um, just, uh, just to the other side of that vertex are three little dots. Those are the ocelli, singular is ocellus. Um, those are uh, simple eyes that gather light, and, and um, that's in contrast to the compound eyes, the big ones, that um, are really the vision, the vision apparatus for a bee. Um, the thorax has numerous segments to it that we don't teach uh, because we don't, we can't really see them under the hair. We just call it the thorax in most cases when talking to volunteers about this stuff. Um, the abdomen, as I said earlier, is divided into uh, tergites or abbreviated as T. So in this female bee that we have six of them, T1 through six. And ideally in photos, we'll be able to see the breaks between the segments where one segment overlaps the next one that's distal to it. Uh, moving along clockwise here, the corbicula, also called the pollen basket, is that segment on the hind leg where females of non-cuckoo bumblebee species have uh, will gather their pollen to carry it. And of course, they have wings, two sets of wings, um, which are not depicted in this image. One important morphological characteristic that I want to um, emphasize here is the cheek. The cheek is defined as the area between the bottom of the compound eye and where the mandible hinges onto the face. So the mandible, you can see one of the mandibles under the head in this picture. It's the, it's the jaw, if you will. The other one is hidden from view. Those hinge onto the head, onto the, uh, onto the head right where the, the bottom red arrow is. So the thing we're comparing is the length of that area as compared to its width. And in this example, which is the rusty patch bumblebee, does not occur here. Um, the the malar the cheek or the malar space is shorter than it is wide. Um, in many of our species, it'll be about the same, confusingly, uh, meaning it'll be about equal as as long as it is wide. And then for some of them, it's distinctly longer than wide. And this is a very important identification character. Um, it's one of the only physical traits we teach you other than, aside from the hair color, um, but it is, is really important and it is a little challenging uh, to learn. So I just encourage you to look at the face of the bee and try to find the cheek and convince yourself of whether it's longer than wide, um, wider than long, et cetera. I'm gonna use this flow chart for identifying the bumblebees um, as we go through here. And so we're gonna start with a mystery insect at the top and we're gonna first distinguish it from other insects. Then we're gonna distinguish, assuming we have a bee, we'll distinguish bumblebees from other bees. And then assuming we have a bumblebee, we'll distinguish males from females. And finally, we will separate the cuckoos or citherus from the non citherus or non cuckoo bumblebees um, by a, a character of their hind leg. So let's get into it. And I'm gonna go quickly through this in the interest of time but we can, you can always come back to the recording. Um, so first of all, distinguishing bees and other insects. Um, here's a picture of a bunch of insects. Uh, and the question for you is, which of them are bees? And I'm gonna not give you very much time to decide and I'm gonna let you know, the least bee looking one is the bee and all of the others are flies. So there are many insects that closely resemble bumblebees. Um, it's a mimicry thing in many cases where they're, they're resembling a stinging insect to avoid being eaten by predators. Um, and so many flies and wasps and even moths and butterflies can look just so close to uh, bumblebees and, and so much so that um, they fool uh, editors of books like this bees of the world. You'd think that they would get this right, but no, they put a fly on the cover of the first edition. Happily, they got around to putting a bumblebee on the second edition. Um, so it's not easy to distinguish bumblebees or even bees from some of the other uh, insects. Um, here are some characteristics that bees all share. 
They all evolved from a wasp-like ancestor. And as Rich talked about, the key adaptation that they have that is different from their wasp-like ancestors is that they eat pollen as their protein source. Um, all the wasps, all the ants, um, all the other relatives of bees, they are almost entirely meat eaters, or at least they feed animal protein to their larva to make more of themselves. Um, bees are vegetarians. They eat plant protein, they eat plant pollen instead of animal protein um, as their protein source. That is a distinctive behavioral difference. Um, and what follows from the behavioral differences is all these morphological adaptations to harvest and carry the pollen and also the nectar, which they depend on and find at flowers. So bees have long tongues, they have a, a corbicula or a pollen basket, or um, it's called a scopa for some type for most types of bees instead of a corbicula. Sorry to be confusing about that, but that is the way it is. Um, all bees have branched hairs somewhere on their body. Uh, Rich showed a nice image of this. Um, it, you might need a microscope to see them, but these branched hairs help them to carry pollen on the outside of their body. Um, and it's important to understand that some bees, not, not bumblebees, but some other types of bees carry pollen in their gut. So you can't see it on the outside of the female bee. So let's imagine that we have decided this is a bumblebee and not one of the other bees. I've got two sets of resources on the left and the right here, um, most of which I've described already um, that I would suggest you go to for each of those two taxonomic groups. Um, so uh, distinguishing a bumblebee from the other bees, well, um, bumblebees are very large, they're robust in size, and they're hairy. They're just quite shaggy compared to most other uh, bees. Um, they have um, this black and yellow hair coloration, often stripes. Um, that's the typical sort of stereotypical bumblebee. We see lots of other colors on their body, on their hair. So oranges, reds, browns, gray, um, white, uh, and mixes of, of the different hair colors, but yellow and black are the, the base colors in most cases. Um, they have the pollen basket on the hind leg and um, the pollen basket for bumblebees, it's actually a shiny hairless area surrounded by bristles. The bee packs the pollen into the shiny hairless area and the bristles are like the, the top of the basket. They keep everything intact. And that is distinctly different from the pollen carrying apparatus of other bees, which is a, a brush of hairs in, on the same leg in many cases. We'll next talk about distinguishing male bees from female bees. So uh, this is not too tricky once you get a hold of the basic anatomy of the bees. Um, um, male bumblebees have seven abdominal segments instead of six. Uh, male bumblebees have 13 antennal segments instead of 12. And of course, they don't have a pollen carrying apparatus. They don't have a, a pollen basket or, or a corbicula on the hind leg. They do have a, that segment of their leg, but you will see it, it doesn't have a fully hairless area with big bristles that arch over it. It's really pretty distinctively different. Um, so these bees are not, should not be too difficult for us to distinguish males versus females. There are some cases where it's, it's pretty tricky. Um, males can look just like females in their color pattern or they can be quite distinct. Um, they tend to be shaggier, uh, and so longer hair. Um, and uh, importantly, males cannot sting. They have no stinger. So um, you don't wanna test the, the assumption that you have a male by handling it. Um, but uh, if you did handle a male bumblebee, you would be safe from stings. So if we know it's a female or a male, how do we know if it's a cuckoo bumblebee versus the others? I'm not gonna talk much about this in the interest of time. Uh, to repeat, female non scytherous bumblebees are the ones with the shiny hairless area on the hind leg with the big bristles around it. And that's where they carry the pollen, again, a corbicula or pollen basket. The scytherous females have that body segment and it can be shiny, but it is usually not concave and it is usually hairy itself instead of being hairless in the, in the inside. And then in the males, neither type of male has a pollen carrying apparatus because they don't harvest pollen. Um, in the non scytherous bees, it's a bit more shiny than in the scytherous bees. And as a novice, it can be difficult to distinguish male scytherous from male non scytherous. It does take some practice. Um, and this is the, the place to start with this character. I'm now gonna talk about some of the bumblebees of California, the species. We have 25 native species and at least one uh, species that, uh, one species that's been found here that's not native and it's not established, but it has been found a number of times. 
Um, I've divided them in this simple field graphic, this field key graphic into color patterns. So for example, at number one, all of the bees in the number one box have orange or red hair somewhere on the abdomen. The next segment, it's black and yellow striped bees and every single one of them, the first abdominal segment on it. The next box, same thing, except none of them have yellow hair on that first abdominal segment. The next ones have white hair somewhere on the body. And finally, we have three cuckoo bumblebees or citrus species. So this is not enough to identify all of the bumblebee species of California, but it's a good start. And it can help us crosswalk from this beautiful photo of what turns out to be Suckley's bumblebee to um, the actual image, the little cartoony graphic. So here I'm um, in squares, I've got the four species that are candidates for listing under California's Endangered Species Act currently, and the ones that are protected by state law and by CDFW now. And they're the reasons we need to have that MOU permit, right? Um, so uh, I've got six boxes because two of the bees um, uh, occur twice in this little graphic. And so I'm gonna tell you about each of those four species, and then I'll show you a few close lookalikes. And that's all the time we'll have to, for this tonight. First, we'll start with Franklin's bumblebee or Bombus franklini. This is our rarest species. Uh, this species unfortunately could even be extinct. Um, it's found only in a narrow, about 120 mile long, north to south uh, home range from Northern California to Southern Oregon. And we haven't, nobody has reported an observation or a specimen since 2006. So that's a very long time, um, given that a lot of people have been looking for this bee in its very small home range. Um, so this is a species we're quite concerned about. Um, these purple arrows are gonna show you on each of these, uh, the next slides, what field characters you should be looking for. Um, this is a bee that has yellow hair on the front of the thorax. It has a distinctive horseshoe shaped a uh, black notch in the center of the thorax that goes into the yellow that I just described. I hope you can see that. It's a sort of a, an oval shape. Um, it has, uh, uh, sorry, it has yellow facial hair, but you can't see that in this image. And then um, it has yellow to some degree on T5 and or T6. Uh, you can see this illustrated in the little uh, cartooning graphics to the left of the photo. And you can see that hair on this B, right? Um, and uh, it, the maps that I'm gonna show you, his, quote unquote, historic observations, those made before 2001 uh, are orange, and then I'll have more recent observations in blue. And in this map, there are no blue for obvious reasons. I'm gonna compare Franklin's to these three um, so-called yellow-faced bumblebees, and I'll leave it at that. There are some other species, including the Western bumblebee, which we'll see in a second, that are very similar um, to, at least to the untrained eye. So these are three bees that are mostly black. They have prominent areas of yellow hair on the face, and um, they have yellow on the front of the thorax, just like Franklin and I. And then they have a yellow stripe towards the end of the abdomen, similar to Franklin and I. Now, Franklin and I has uh, much less yellow hair there than these, than these guys do. In fact, it, it uh, rarely, if ever, has a complete yellow band there. It will be a yellow band that's broken by black. By contrast, these guys have nice strong bands for the most part. Um, and these guys have the band on either uh, T4 for two of them or T3 for one of them. And I told you that Franklin I has it farther down on T5 and T6. These are nuances that you're gonna have to get used to as you identify bumblebees. Um, but uh, that, is, that is how it is. Um, so let's move on to Bombus occidentalis, the Western bumblebee. And this one uh, also closely can closely resemble um, Franklin's bumblebee. So if you think you've seen Franklin's, you definitely want to think about whether you're instead handling this one. This is the next most likely um, close lookalike. Um, this is a bee that has um, pale hair at the tip of the abdomen. In this image, it's it's reddish orange and, and some or yellowy orange. In some California specimens, it's that color. Much more commonly around the West, it is white, as you can see in the thumbnail, uh, cartoony images there. It's all white. Um, this is a bee with, uh, with black across the back of the thorax, uh, usually, uh, I'll say often with black hair on the face. It has a very, it has a short malar space, a short cheek, so its cheek is shorter than it is wide. I should have said that is also true for Franklin eye. Um, 
And uh, so this is a bee that is also in, in drastic decline in California. You can see that it used to be common or, around the, in the Bay Area and along the North Coast. We uh, have not seen it there in more than 10 years. And in fact, um, the only place it reliably turns up now is in the Northern Sierra Nevada Mountains where there's that cluster of blue points. So let's look at a couple of other common, more common ones that look, can be um, confused with Western bumblebee. Um, this one, once you get to know bumblebees, is really not that hard to distinguish from Western bumblebee, but, um, but beginners can easily uh, get them wrong. Um, this one has, uh, this is called Bombus fervidus or yellow bumblebee. Um, you'll see in the cartoons that it is almost entirely yellow in some places. Those places are in Eastern North America um, and parts of the West. Where we are, the bee usually looks like this. It's mostly black. And so it's mimicking, it's similar in coloration to all of these other, like uh, the, the yellow-faced bumblebee, Franklin bumblebee, Western bumblebee. It's mostly black bee with a yellow band on the front of the thorax and then a yellow band on the abdomen. So at a glance, you might think, oh, that could be the Western bumblebee. Notice this bee has no pale hair at the tip of the abdomen on T6 and 7, I'm sorry, T5 and 6 for this female. Um, so no question, it is not the Western bumblebee. Um, um, but on the wing or when you're new to this, you might not see it right away. Importantly, this bee has a very distinctly long cheek. It is longer than it is wide. And it, this is a good one to start with. You'll easily see that character um, along the face. Um, quickly, this one can be confused with uh, the Western bumblebee also. It's called Sitka bumblebee or Bombus sitkensis. It is mostly found on the North Coast in California and indeed up in the Pacific Coast as far as Alaska and um, for the most part not found very far inland with one exception there in Utah and adjacent areas um, as you can see in the map. Um, it's shaggy, it's quite shaggy and it has a lot of mixing of black and white hair. Um, these are things that we don't see in the Western bumblebee in most cases and so that's pretty distinctly different. It has a much longer, it has a cheek that's uh, just slightly longer than wide. Um, and I told you that Western bumblebee has a shorter than wide cheek. So that's a thing you can notice. The reason people get tripped up with this one is it does have pale hair at the end of the abdomen. Um, it's a creamy color in most cases, like in this photo. Um, and so Western bumblebee can have that creamy hue in, in its tail hair, um, but th th this is just a different species. So um, there are some really good obvious characters to distinguish this one from Western bumblebee. Um, oops. Uh, okay, we've got uh, two more, I think. So uh, Bombus crotchii or crotch's bumblebee. This is a denizen of the warmer parts of the state, the, the southern, um, uh, not the hottest Mojave desert areas, but southern low elevation places, um, coastal sage scrub, montane places that aren't too high in elevation, um, the Central Valley. And this bee is in, um, is in pretty distinct decline. And we're trying to figure out just, just how, uh, how much in decline it is. So this one has quite short hair. It's a large, just beautiful animal. Um, it looks like it's made of velvet or it's had a haircut recently. All the hair is sort of the same length. Um, it has a short face, a short cheek, sorry. Um, it has yellow hair at the top of the head on the, on the cheek, oh, sorry, on the vertex, getting tired. Um, it has black hair on T1, not entirely in many cases, but it has black hair right at, at, at T1 there. Um, it has a yellow band on the abdomen, and it can uh, either have or not have reddish hair at the tip of the tail. So people might think this looks a little like, uh, like a Western bumblebee. It really doesn't. Um, based on my, my description, you might think that, but um, it, does it can often have this reddish hair at the tip of the tail. In fact, that is the more common look than the one you're seeing here. Uh, one bee that we can confuse this one for in California is Bombus nevadensis, the Nevada bumblebee. This one uh, mostly will look like this photo does with um, these striking yellow bands on the abdomen. It doesn't look anything like uh, Crotch's bumblebee when it is like that. But as you can see in the cartoons, there is one look where it has a red tail and lots of black on the abdomen, just like Crotch's bumblebee. Um, these places are few and far between and have not been resurveyed in a long time. So uh, the, the ones that look like Crotchy would come from Humboldt, Humboldt County and also from San Miguel Island. And those are the only places we've ever seen it look like that. Um, and lastly, for this species, 
Bombus rufus cinctus, or the red-belted bumblebee, can be confused for Bombus crotchii because of all that red that it sometimes has on its abdomen. This is a highly variable species. It's also got short hair. Um, it can have just about any color pattern. It is just crazy how variable it is. Um, it has a short face. Uh, and um, let's see, it has uh, a distinctive oval-shaped black dot or oval on the top of the thorax, which um, can distinguish it from other species. And it does uh, usually have yellow hair distally towards the back of the thorax, as you see in this image. One last rare species, um, this one, another candidate for listing. This is Bombus sucklii or the suckley cuckoo bumblebee. This one is extremely rare in California and um, it has been seen in the last 20 years, but just twice. And in fact, it's only ever been found in California something like five times. So we're unlikely to find this bee, uh, I guess, just based on its, its existing rarity, but, um, but we're looking. Right, so this is a cuckoo bumblebee. It does not have a, a corbicula or pollen basket on its hind leg. Um, the purple arrow that's pointing to the tip of the tail, it has a really distinctive character where the, the, um, the last segment of the abdomen on females, the bottom part, which is called a sternal segment, is longer than the top part, the turtle segment. So you can see it's sticking out underneath. Um, it's not really depicted in this image. Um, these bees do have this yellow band on, uh, on the abdomen where you see that on, I think it's T4, uh, it's usually inter, uh, it's usually broken by that black hair in the middle or medially, and that will distinguish it from, um, oh, and sorry, I'll also say it has yellow hair on the thorax, black hair on the head, uh, on a face, and um, these things should all distinguish it from this guy, which is our most common cuckoo bumblebee, Bombus insularis, or indiscriminate cuckoo bumblebee, um, this one importantly has yellow hair on the face, right between the eyes, right where the antenna originate, you should see a patch of yellow hair. It can be huge and obvious, or it can be just a few, just a little bit of yellow hair, depending on the individual bee. It has a strong black band across the back. It has, um, it has varying amounts of yellow hair on, uh, on the abdomen. And um, this one has this black break of hair uh, in the segments there also, uh, the yellow hair on the abdominal segments. These are not too difficult to tell apart with that yellow hair on the face for this particular species. Um, with that, I'll say thank you for joining us. And that is the end of our presentation, our workshop. Um, on the screen here, you can see the URL for uh, the quiz that you need to pass to get your name onto the scientific collecting permit. That is, if you are new to the project, if you are a returning volunteer, you do not have to take the quiz. You are already named on the permit and you are permitted until September 1st of 2023. So you can skip the test, the quiz. Um, don't get psyched out by the, the word quiz or test. Uh, this is pretty easy if you've been paying attention. Um, and if you don't take it right now, you can find a link to it on the website and take it at a later time. Um, and with that, I will say uh, thank you. And I don't, think we have time to take more questions now. Rich, what do you think? I have been working to try to answer all the questions that came up in the Q&A. I typed answers. <clears throat> Hopefully folks can actually see those, although I'm not entirely sure. But what we can do is um, when, when, when we close this out, we'll get a report with the, with the, with the questions and answers, and we can save that as a PDF as well as the chat and, and send that out to everybody so that you can have the, the answers to the questions in case you didn't get a chance to see it during the webinar. Great, okay. Wonderful, yeah. well, thanks. A few, a few folks have asked if we can save the chat and I will, um, I will make sure to, I think the whole thing gets exported and we will save it and send it out to everybody that attended tonight. So thank you. Yes. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us and um, pay attention to the events page of our website where we will be advertising field events and other fun stuff. Um, and please get in touch if you have questions about the Alice. A couple of quick questions just came in, Leaf, while you were talking there. Yeah. <laughs> They're pouring in the oven. Um, so question about grid cells. Yes, multiple people can adopt a single grid cell. Eventually, we yeah. may try to encourage folks to go further afield to to hit some of the areas that haven't been surveyed yet. Um, but yes, multiple people can adopt a single grid cell. 
And then if you have additional questions after this, Leif and I and Dylan are all available. Um, you can find our contact information on the website. Um, and uh, you can also just email bumblebeeatlas at xerces.org and you will find us uh, in there as well. So um, yeah, feel free to reach out as any additional questions come up. <clears throat> we're here for you and we wanna answer your questions. So send them to us if you have them, please.